stress can get under our skin. It's not just a feeling or an emotion that passes over us. Stress has consequences. My name is Natalie Riddell. I'm a lecturer in immunology and aging, and I study how stress can affect the immune system. I'm interested in how stress can change the way that we respond to infections and cancers. And I believe that if we can understand how stress changes the immune system and how it regulates the immune system, we may be able to manipulate and control our immune, immune response to stress. And this may help us promote better health outcomes. During stress, two hormones are released, adrenaline and cortisol. And both these hormones can directly act upon the immune system. And this means that these hormones can impact upon health. They can do many things to the immune system, including changing the uh, number of cells that are in our blood or in our organs, and also changing the way that these cells respond and recognize things such as infections and cancers. The levels of these hormones change throughout the day, depending on what time of day it is. They have circadian rhythm, and this is thought to promote um, act immune activation during the day, which will protect us and promote tissue repair and regeneration of a night when we're at rest. And one of the consequences of stress is that it can alter this circadian rhythm, and this can then impact health. So why do we think that stress is bad? Most people have either been stressed themselves or know someone who has been stressed who has then become ill. But there's also scientific evidence to support this. In the 1970s, Holmes and Ray developed a stress scale they took um, over 14 normal life events, some of them quite major life events, like losing um, a loved one um, or otherwise relationship breakups, and some um, not so major life events, such as Christmas. And they gave each of these different stressors a stress score. And they tallied up the amount of stress that a person had experienced in the previous year, and this was able to predict the likelihood of illness in those individuals. So this really showed that there's a, there is an association between stress and health outcomes. And stress doesn't just affect the individual. It also can affect and have a huge impact on society. The health and safety executive who monitor and regulate the health of the workforce here in Great Britain found in 2006 that the second most commonly reported reason for ill health was because of stress. This equated to 45% of all work days lost due to ill health. That's 11.7 million sick days. And these numbers could actually be a lot larger because most people won't actually report that the reason that they're off work is because of stress, because it's, there's such a stigma associated with stress and mental health. And even quite mundane daily life events can cause stress. Today, I was stuck in traffic and I become quite irritated. I also get really embarrassed if I forget somebody's name. And even the social expectations that we put upon ourselves and put upon each other can cause a stress response. And this is becoming ever more prevalent in the world of social media, where we've, we're con constantly exposed 24-7. And each of these stressors, although very different, cause the same stress response. There's one theory from evolutionary psychologists that we have a Stone Age brain. This doesn't mean that our brain hasn't evolved at all since the Stone Age, just that it hasn't adapted enough. And this could be true for the stress response. You can imagine that the types of stressors that we face in the modern world are very different to our cavemen ancestors. So it is possible that our adaptation to stress does not serve us well um, when we're considering the modern day stressors. So stress, it's a big thing. It's an important part of our biology. So how can we define stress? In the 1960s, the psychologist Richard Lazarus defined stress as being an association between appraisal and coping. So when a stressful event occurs, we assess our ability and our resources to deal with that stressful event. If we believe that we can cope, then everything's fine. But if not, we become stressed. Put simply, it's a situation or an event that exceeds or is perceived to exceed our ability to cope. And this results in an emotional response and a biological adaptation, such as anxiety and activation of the sympathetic nervous system. So stress is something, an event that is out of our control, that we feel we can't cope with, and causes a biological adaptation. Our biological adaptation is activation of your sympathetic nervous system. 
And as you can see from this diagram here, the sympathetic nervous system innervates many organs throughout the body. This means that during stress, many physiological adaptations occur, including an increase in our heart rate, an increase in respiratory rate, and also greater energy production. And this all allows increased physical capacity for the individual to cope with whatever the stressor is. So it's a good thing. It's our fight and flight response. It um, promotes the survival of the individual. We also see um, stimulation of the adrenal gland, and this results in the release of the hormones adrenaline and cortisol. And these are released directly into the blood where they're able to then circulate and act throughout the body. Each and every one of the organs of the immune system are innervated by the sympathetic nervous system. So this means they are under um, regulation of the sympathetic nervous system during stress. Also, each of the cells of the immune system express adrenergic receptors and glucocorticoid receptors. So this makes them responsive to adrenaline and cortisol. For example, um, well, every process of the immune system is affected by stress. So for example, the development of new immune cells in the bone marrow is altered during stress. Also, the initiation of immune response to stress in the lymph nodes is affected. And the cells, when they're out in the peripheral tissues, such as um, the lungs or the guts or the skin, they are also um, affected by adrenaline and cortisol. So considering that the stress adaptation response is meant to be a beneficial response that promotes our survival, we would expect the immune system response to stress to also promote survival of the individual. And that is indeed what happens during acute psychological stress. So stresses that last just for minutes or hours. So as I'm stood here in front of you today, I am having a stress response. My heart rate is through the roof. Adrenaline is rushing through my veins, and so are a very large number of immune cells. As you can see from this graph, during acute stress, and this, and this data was um, from, some, or from individuals that were giving a 10-minute talking task, or doing a 10-minute talking task, you can see that the stressor almost more than doubled the amount of immune cells present in the peripheral blood, compared to blood samples taken at baseline when the person wasn't stressed. And as soon as the stress finishes, the number of immune cells in the blood returns to normal. And what my work and other uh, work by others have shown is that not all cells respond during stress. Only the soldiers of the immune system respond. So these are the cells that are able to migrate into the inflamed tissues. And once there, they can immediately eradicate any infections that they come into contact with. So acute psychological stress does boost our immune system. It promotes um, um, our protection against infections. And this, we believe, will promote the survival of the individual. However, most common day stressors don't actually, or nowadays, do not come with the threat of infection and injury. So how does the physiological response to stress manifest in the modern era? Imagine that an individual has an underlying inflammatory condition. When they become stressed, they see this increase in the soldiers of their immune system surveying the body. This could aggravate the inflammatory condition that they have. And what happens if the stress doesn't just last for minutes or hours? What if it goes on for weeks or months or even years? The stress adaptation response did not evolve to last for that long, and consequently, it can't. In the 1930s, Hans Saley um, recognized this, and he described three stages of the general adaptation syndrome. The first stage was the stress response. So this is when the individual has a fight and flight response. But we can't maintain this level, level of excitement um, for a long time. So we then move into a state of adaptation. So this is where the body builds up resistance to the stress. And finally, if the stress becomes chronic, then we become exhausted. The system becomes exhausted. And it's when this exhausted, exhausted state is reached that we become ill. The immune system is a delicate balance between immune protection against infections and cancers and immune regulation, which will prevent inflammatory disorders. It stops self-harm. It stops an overzealous immune response. So it will stop autoimmune diseases. What we see during stress is the worst of both worlds. We see a loss of this balance, and we see decreased immune protection, and we see increased inflammation. And this is very similar to what we see within old individuals when we look at their immune system. So this may suggest that chronic stress can also promote premature aging of the immune system. So we believe that chronic stress 
um, via this loss of normal immune regulation and by aging the immune system may mediate the association between stress and increased incidences of infections, malignancies, and also inflammatory conditions. So chronic stress is a good thing that has gone bad. So the adaptation, the stress adaptation response, was originally a good thing, but when it becomes chronic, it becomes a bad thing. But we can't stop stress. Uh, we can't stop it happening. But as stress only occurs when an individual perceives that they cannot cope, may be able to teach resilience to stress. And our best weapon against stress is social intervention. In studies of caregivers with spouse, spouses with dementia, um, we found that their immune system is suppressed. If you give caregivers a vaccination, they have a reduced immune response. But the level of this reduction is directly correlated to how much social, social support they feel they have. Those individuals with very little social support have a worse immune response to vaccination than those, than those who have higher social support. And in the individuals that have very little social support, if you actually provide them with a support network, their immune system and their immune response improves. Or if you um, engage them in therapies such as mind-body therapies, this can also improve their immune response. So we really have a window here where we can um, increase social engagement at work or we can provide support networks to isolated, vulnerable people in society, and we may be able to improve their immune function and improve their overall well-being. Usually, prevention is better than cure. And one way that we can try to prevent stress is by teaching people to understand and manage their stress. For example, teaching people mindfulness can actually improve their cognitive function and their overall well-being. And this has been demonstrated in student populations, military personnel, and also in cancer patients. And teaching emotional intelligence, the importance of it is now becoming recognized. So it's now being taught in some schools. And the health and safety, safety executive has um, placed stress management as one of their top three priorities. And this is because of the condemning figures that I showed you earlier demonstrating that stress is now the second most common cause of work-related illness. And we need to talk about stress. We need people to understand that stress, the stress response is a normal physiological response. And we will hopefully, this will help remove the stigma associated with stress. And we need to engage the policy makers. We know that physiological, the physiological response to chronic stress is causing ill health in individuals. It's associated with some of the most common diseases um, facing the, the modern world, such as heart disease and dementia. These are some of the biggest killers currently in, in society. But despite this, and despite the fact that stress management is easily and affordable to do compared to other medical inventions, we don't try to manage stress nearly enough. So we really need to encourage the policymakers to take stress seriously and put it upon the agenda. So I truly believe that by managing stress and teaching people resilience, we will be able to promote health and well-being in everyone from children right through to the elderly. And this will help people be the best they can and feel the best they can. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>